This is a production of Cornell University. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm Kate McCullough, and I'm the Director of Undergraduate Studies in the English Department currently. Um, and I want to welcome you to the Book Sandwich Den. Some of you I know I've been, have been here before. I see some familiar faces. Um, but for those of you who are here for the first time, um, this is a new series that the English Department has implemented this year, designed especially for undergrads. And the point of the series is just to give undergraduates a chance to meet and get to know a little bit uh, of the faculty in a kind of informal setting in which you have the opportunity to not only have a delicious free lunch, but also chat with. So I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Chaffetz today. Um, he, is the, he has a really uh, impressive title. He is the Ernest I. White Professor of American Studies and Humane Letters at Cornell. Do you think there's a chair of inhumane letters? That's somewhere? what I'm wondering. I'm wondering how humane letters are. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting to pursue. So Professor Chaffetz earned his master's degree and his PhD at Johns Hopkins before embarking on a long and illustrious career. He is the author of, when I looked up, when I looked him up, the list of his publications is really longer than my arm, as they would say. So I'm not going to go through all of that. I will just say that he has published many, many articles and books. And um, his first book was called The Poetics of Imperialism, Translation and Colonization from the Tempest to Tarzan, uh, published in 91, right? Yeah, it's actually the second book. But that's second. Okay. Oh, sorry. The Emerson, there was a book on Emerson that oh, right. I turned my PhD thesis into the transparent sexual politics in the language of Emerson, but believe me, you're not supposed to memorize my resume. I That's mean, okay. Well, uh, this book, I mean, I know this book anyway because it had a major impact in the field um, and has remained a kind of major text in uh, colonial, post-colonial studies. So. Um, his latest book is called The, the Parentheses, Post, Close Parentheses, Colonial Construction of Indian Country, U.S. American Indian Literatures and Federal Indian Law. And that continues his ongoing work in uh, American literature and I American Indian literatures more specifically, as well as legal studies. Uh, in addition to his books and articles, Professor Chaffetz has been active as um, what we might think of as a public intellectual, publishing in newspapers and appearing on radio shows and in documentaries and also doing a lot of legal work, um, which perhaps he'll tell us about, in uh, involving issues both of native rights and also uh, academic freedom. So uh, in addition to his teaching at Cornell, he has been the director of Cornell's American Indian program and has also served as the co faculty coordinator for the Mellon Mays undergraduate fellowship program. So he has his hand in a lot of pots. Um, his teaching interests include American literatures, American Indian literatures, and federal Indian law. And I think he's going to tell us more about that. So I'll just stop there and ask you to join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I appreciate that. We're gonna, I'm just going to talk. Uh, this is informal. Uh, I just gave a big formal talk, and so it's time for an informal uh, uh, talk. And um, I'm uh, concerned about the state of indigenous studies here at Cornell. The humanities uh, have been under fire uh, generally, and enrollments have gone down. When I first got here 10 years ago, uh, when I did a course on the American Indian novel or an introduction to American Indian literature, I could expect 10 to 15 people in the classroom. And now I'm lucky if these classes make. Um, so um, that's, uh, that's problematic. We, how many people are aware of the American Indian program here? Okay, how many people have taken a course in indigenous studies any, anywhere on campus? We, I mean, they're all over in anthropology and natural resources and um, art history. Uh, how many? I'd just like to see the hands have taken the course. Okay, so um, uh, I, what I want to try to do today is tell you why I think it's essential. I, I would actually like to see a requirement here. We're on the homelands of the Cayuga people, the traditional homelands of the Cayuga people. How many people are aware of the Cayugas? Okay, a couple people are aware of, yeah. <laughs> a couple of people are aware of the Cayugas. They're part of the uh, six nations of the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois nation, um, as they're known, and, and they're uh, alive and well and uh, resisting in many ways the uh, imposition of the federal government. Uh, Kate mentioned uh, a book I wrote. It's actually a book within a book. Um, I edited the Columbia Guide to uh, American Indian Literature since 1945, and the first part of that book is this book, The Post, put post in parentheses, colonial uh, 
uh, construction of Indian country, U.S. American Indian literatures and federal Indian law. I put post in parentheses because actually American Indians um, are still a colonized people here in the United States. We don't like to uh, admit that, but federal Indian law is a colonial body of law and it operates on the reservations. So I put post in parentheses because since 1924, um, Indians uh, were made citizens by fiat. They didn't ask to be made citizens. Congress just has been trying to assimilate or get Indians to assimilate historically when they stopped killing them, which was at the end of the 19th century. Uh, there was a genocide here that the government has not owned up to um, officially in any way, shape, or form. And that genocide takes the form of, in 1492, in what would become the lower 48 states, there were four to five, this is a conservative estimate, four to five million uh, native peoples here, and by the end of the 19th century, it was 250,000. And that was the direct cause of outright uh, murder, ethnic cleansing, biological warfare. Um, we could go on and on. Um, so um, it, that, that's a part of our history that we, um, we really haven't, we haven't, come to, um, haven't come to terms with. But I put post in parentheses because since 1924, Indians are citizens of the United States. So, but on the reservation, they come under a different agenda, which is federal Indian law. And that citizenship is compromised then uh, when you're on the reservation by federal Indian law. So it's this, uh, this jurisdictional conflict, off the reservation, citizen on the reservation, um, citizen in parentheses, um, Indian uh, in capital in capital letters, and that is a colonial space. The federal government, by law, owns most of Indian country. That's a legal term. Um, Indians now do buy land freehold. That means they hold the title to it, but most of that reservation land is held by the federal government. Um, and it's called in trust for the Indians. This, this makes the Indians by law, or Indian tribes by law, minors before the law. Uh, the federal government is their permanent uh, trustee. They never get to reach their majority, so to speak, right? So if you guys have a trustee when you're 18 or 21, typically you get the property and you can do with it what you want. Uh, but for Indians, that, um, that state of pupillage, that's how Justice John Marshall defined it in 1831 in a famous case called Cherokee Nation versus Georgia. So from the beginnings of the Constitution forward, what has happened is Indian sovereignty has been slowly chipped away um, by the federal government. Um, and this is an important part of our history. I, my feeling is if you don't know these things, um, if you don't know the history of, of Indians, both here at Cornell, locally in the in New York region and globally, um, that there's a hole in your education. Um, it's like trying to know American history without knowing about slavery, for example, right? What if no one here knew that there was slavery in the... Uh, in the beginnings of the country right up until the Civil War. I mean, what would that do to your perception of the world today? Uh, you uh, might wonder all kinds of things, uh, not knowing that. Um, wonder all kinds of things about the black community and its position in the United States of America. Well, most people don't know about Indians. I mean, we have this whole debate going on now, which is an obscene debate about whether the Washington Redskins should drop their name, right? Well, Redskins is a racist term. You know, if it was the Washington N-word, right, nobody would stand or tolerate that. But everybody seems to be able to tolerate uh, racism against Indians, and that's in part because no one knows the history uh, of Indians in this country. Uh, many people, I think, don't even think there are Indians left uh, in the United States. The population has increased since from the 250,000, um, since uh, uh, the hot wars uh, stopped at that point, to around 4 million today, 2 million of whom uh, are affiliated uh, with various reservations. There are 334 reservations in the lower 48 states, and there are 228 Alaska Native villages. And Hawaii, which uh, also the Native Hawaiians claim a colonial status, but the federal government has not worked out any kind of relationship with them. Um, the agreements up in Alaska are different than the, uh, the way the law works um, down here because the Alaska natives never signed any treaties with the United States. Federal Indian law is based on a treaty uh, relationship, and of course the federal government has uh, felt free to violate that treaty relationship whenever it is in the to the advantage of the federal government, which is usually in the taking of land, a tremendous land grab. This is all about land. Um, so I start my classes, when I'm, whether they're American studies broadly construed or Native American studies, because I'm always teaching Native stuff necessarily in any of these courses. I always start my uh, classes by telling uh, people two facts. I think these are incontrovertible facts. 
that the United States of America is built on stolen Indian land with stolen African labor. And then you sort of stir capitalism into the mix, um, and you get the history of the United States. Okay. So um, all of this is, um, I think, important. Um, now, a couple of other points. Um, so I'm writing a book, uh, which is almost done, called Disinformation, The Limits of Capitalism's Imagination and the Decline of uh, Liberal Democracy. I'm always debating whether to call it the end of liberal democracy or the decline, because I think liberal democracy is near dead. And I don't think it's going to get revived, actually. So the limits of capitalism's imagination interest me, and I'll talk about that um, in a second. Um, the last chapter in the book, uh, which has actually been published as a separate essay, is called What is a Just Society? Native American Philosophies and the Limits of Capitalism's uh, Imagination. So my thinking, or what in part prompted the book, was that um, my feeling is that the United States is facing a tremendous uh, problems, social economic problems. You guys may or may not know that there's an organization of economic and cooperative development, 32 countries, I think, 31, 32 countries, that goes from North America right out to Asia. And they track um, these countries in terms of uh, their standard of living qualities, quality of life standards income inequality, health, what have you. And the United States, among those 31 countries, is, third, is 27th in the world. Um, we have a very, very, very bad record. Um, we're 37th in the world in terms of health uh, care. Um, and um, we used to be uh, thought of as a country where upward mobility was possible. Now we're declining in, in that area as well. We, it's, there's more upward mobility in both England and Canada, for example, than there is in the United States of America. Um, so here we have all these problems, and I'm looking at the two political parties in, in this book, and they seem to me like one political party, basically. They, they, they talk rhetorically, there's a big difference. But if you actually look at what gets done on the ground, there's not much different at all. And I think one of the problems here, right, is the corporate control of the American political process. Uh, that famous Supreme Court decision, Citizens United, which gave the corporations even more control than they already had, I think, um, is, is indicative of this. So how is the United States going to solve these problems if, if, if it is, if it keeps thinking in the same sort of what I call capitalist imaginary? Okay. And my answer to that is we better start thinking from a different place. I have a course I give called Thinking from a Different Place, and the subtitle of that course is Indigenous Philosophies. If you go down to a place like Bolivia, for example, today, which has a 62% self-identified indigenous population and had a revolution beginning in 2000, which uh, threw out uh, two neoliberal governments and instituted an indigenous government. Evo Morales is the president. He's an Aymara Indian. Um, in Bolivia. If you look at Bolivia uh, and look at their constitution um, as compared to the United States Constitution, you'll see some striking differences. By the way, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, who is uh, uh, an alumna of uh, Cornell, uh, said publicly, it was in the New York Times, that's where I found it, that if she were to recommend a model for new constitutions in emerging countries, she would not recommend the United States Constitution. And in fact, since the 1970s, less countries have been, a, the U.S. Constitution used to be the paradigm constitution. But beginning in the 1970s, countries started not to use the U.S. Constitution as a paradigm constitution. And one of the reasons is, is that economic rights become very important, and we have no economic rights in our Constitution. There's solely political rights divorced from economic rights, which seems to me one of the problems um, that, that we do have. So if you look at the Bolivian Constitution, for example, there is a, a, a whole section on economic uh, rights. And not only that, and this is true of Ecuador as well, and both of these constitutions were, um, were, uh, had a tremendous uh, indigenous input, uh, so-called Mother Nature, uh, was given human rights in both of these constitutions. Now, working that out in, in, in practical terms is difficult because extractive industries are important in both Bolivia and, uh, and uh, Ecuador. Uh, and so um, uh, giving Mother Nature full human rights is, uh, becomes, a difficult, uh, becomes a difficult issue. But these countries are actually thinking about these issues in these terms, whereas in the United States, we can't even get a minimum wage law passed, uh, which would just be a new poverty wage, $10, $10 an hour. I mean, anybody here want to 
leave Cornell and work for $10 an hour, um, even though all, all of us in the English department work for $10 an hour. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, no, I don't, I don't think so. We need a, you know, a, a reasonable, what reasonable means in this country anymore is hard, is hard to figure out. Um, but a reasonable wage would be something like a living wage, for example, which is what these other constitutions uh, try to guarantee people. Um, Chavez in Venezuela actually brought down the poverty rate by 50%. I mean, he's been demonized in this country. I think in part he's been demonized in this country because he actually did bring down the poverty rate because there is actual redistribution of wealth in these countries um, in, significant, in significant kinds of ways. So the what, what's operating here is an, is an indigenous model. Um, and that's one of the things that, that I teach. I teach a course called Thinking from a Different Place. Who knows, I may teach it again. I'd like to teach it again. I think it's an important course. Um, and we look at first neoliberalism and um, sort of the capitalist models uh, for solving uh, social problems. And then we take a long look at indigenous problems. So indigenous, traditional indigenous thinking, and these are philosophies. Any philosophy, once it gets translated into practical terms, of course, has its, its problems. But I think having a philosophical base is important, because if you can't think about the problems in a certain kind of way, you certainly can't solve them at all. And I think this is the deficit we have here in the United States. So indigenous societies are, first of all, as you may know, communally based. Uh, the, the principal pronoun is not I, it's we. Uh, we is always the principal pronoun, and they're based on extended kinship relationships, which are not based on blood relationships, but on behavioral relationships, okay? So for example, I do a lot of work and have good friends in the Navajo Nation, where I've been working for a long time on various land disputes and things like that. And at Navajo, which is a mat traditionally a matrilineal society, um, the key term is mother. That's the key term, nima. Huh? Uh, and mother doesn't mean my genealogical, biological mother. It's a form of behavior, and it's a form of giving. Uh, what mother means is that you're, you have to, when you're in that relationship with someone, you have to give to them unstintingly. You expect nothing back. And one of the Navajo dicta is good kinsmen are good mothers, okay? So mother is not a gendered or sexed term. It doesn't have a she or a he attached to it in, that, in the way that we do here in the West. It's a term that can apply to men and apply to women. In fact, the major philosophical uh, concept in Navajo is gender balance. Um, all the Navajo stories are about trying to bring the genders into, into balance, which tells you, A, it's been a conflict and a problem, but B, they've been thinking about this problem for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds <laughs> of years. Um, so sheep are called mother. That's the other thing. Kinship is extended throughout the universe, okay? Uh, differences are recognized, of course, but these differences are not absolute and hierarchical. This is extremely important. So you recognize, there is no word in native languages, as far as we can tell, for animal. In other words, species distinctions aren't made. Differences aren't absolute, and they're not hierarchical. They're differences. So the Navajo kill their sheep, whom they call mother. But before they kill those sheep, they have to go through an elaborate ceremony saying why they're killing the sheep, to eat, to live, to thank the sheep for being there, and to promise to nurture those sheep so that they can continue in their, in their, uh, in their own uh, lives. And this ceremonial practice uh, is extremely important because what ceremonies are in native thinking are ways of reflecting on what you're doing before you do it. Um, so uh, a distinction I would make is in the West, we develop technologies without social policy first. And then we find out the technologies have all kinds of deficits as well as some benefits, right? But those deficits become very, very hard to control. Our energy policies probably show you that. We, we have no energy policies now to stop the, the destruction of uh, uh, life on this planet, which is moving ahead rather rapidly. Uh, 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 so in native thinking, they're already thinking what's known as seven generations ahead. And the principal philosophy in any native society, whatever the word is, in Navajo it's hojo, is balance. You, you try to strive for balance, both social balance, which means distributing resources so that everybody can eat and everybody can live decently, and balancing yourself with what we call nature. Okay. There's no word for nature, culture. We have a nature culture divide. 
There's no words for those, in, certainly in Navajo and other native languages. They don't look at these realms as, um, as distinct realms. They're involved, they're imbricated, uh, they're woven together. And because of that, you can't have these op this oppositional mode of thinking, and typically you can't have this hierarchical mode of thinking. So that in the West, as the West has developed, nature and culture have come farther and farther apart from the time of Aristotle and the Greeks, uh, when they were more imbricated, actually. Uh, they've become farther and farther apart, and of course, culture's been privileged over nature, and so now we, f we face the keystone, things like the Keystone Pipeline and tar sands oil and the pollution of the earth because culture is given this validity over, um, over nature. Um, you don't have that kind of philosophical separation um, in native thinking. So um, I think, how long have I been talking? I'm, I'm very anal about this kind of now. Okay, so anyway, well, I wanted to bring that, that full circle. So one, one of the things that Native Studies does is explore Native modes of thinking. I don't think you can have, okay, so I, let me get back to the book I'm writing. I begin the book by saying there's a failure of critical thinking um, in the United States. We have no critical thinking in the public sphere because we're in this loop, this sort of corporate loop, where the only things we can think about are the same Things, okay, that's why you see in, in Congress nothing happening. Um, it's not because the Democrats and the Republicans are at odds. That's, my, that's the usual explanation. I think that's a red herring. It's because they're, they're interlocked. Uh, uh, and that corporate money is determining, the corporate money is, it mediates between the people and the political process now. So I would argue we don't have, we don't have a democracy. But certainly you can't have critical thinking um, without being able to think, this is the name of my course, so I'll use it, without being able to think from a different place. If you're constantly inside something, right, then how can you gain any perspective on what you're inside of? And so for me, native thinking, pursuing that as a discipline um, in various spots, and there's no generic native thinking, one works from various cultures, but one finds certain commonalities, such as kinship, balance, things that I've been talking about. Native thinking then gives me, and I think others who, who pursue it, a point outside of the system, figuratively speaking outside. One's never simply outside of anything. Uh, but figuratively speaking, outside of the system in order to think what might be done with the system to uh, ameliorate the really severe problems uh, that have now become catastrophic because of climate change. Um, so uh, that is the purpose of the courses um, I give. Um, and I would like to see um, more people in those <laughs> courses, obviously. Um, I think um, uh, that, you know, the, the, they present themselves in this way. As far as Cornell goes, I think because we're on um, native land, which was not forcibly taken by Cornell, but at the end of the 18th century was taken through force and fraud. And um, the, I've tracked the Cayuga land cases. They're, they're ongoing now. Uh, the, all the Iroquois land cases, land claims that are being made for broken treaties or illegal treaties are still ongoing. So native resistance is alive and well. That's the other thing. I don't think people are aware when people think of Indians in this country, they think of the 19th century and Buffalo and um, uh, you know, the, all the stereotypes that are presented, which is why you can still have uh, sports teams calling themselves the Washington Redskins. That, using Indian names, by the way, was outlawed by the NAAC, I mean by the NCAA, I almost said the NAACP, it was certainly outlawed by the NAACP <laughs> as well. I don't think they've ever used uh, racist terms for, uh, for, for Indians, but for the, uh, by the NCAA, you cannot have, the only team actually that can still use an Indian name in the NCAA um, is the Florida Seminoles, and that's because the Seminoles have given them the right to use that name, okay. So, but on the pro level, right, this is still, you know, it's gangbusters uh, because corp, and the claim always is, you'll hear Washington say this, right, this, we do this to honor uh, the Indians, right? So you call them a racist term in order to honor them. And, and as you all know, if, if any of you were called a racist term, you find it just honorific. I'm Jewish, and anytime somebody uses an anti-Semitic term, I'm just thrilled. I think, wow, uh, I'm, being, uh, I'm being honored. Uh, what more could I ask for in life? Uh, so um, in any event, uh, I think this has to do with, as I said, a kind of, a kind of erasure of, of uh, an extremely important part 
um, of our history. We have, I'll give you a couple other uh, points here. Uh, Cornell could become more conscious. I think we should have a requirement here in indigenous studies because we are on Cayuga land. Uh, we have asked, when I was um, director of the American Indian Program, we asked Cornell, we asked their uh, lawyers, um, uh, who came to represent uh, David Scorton, uh, that uh, it at least be acknowledged at major Cornell events, convocation, graduation, that we are on the traditional homelands of the Cayuga people. But the Cornells refused to do that. I think they've refused to do that because the state is always in litigation with the Indians, and Cornell does not want to get on the state's nerves. They wouldn't say that to us, but so this is my speculation, but I can't see any other reason because the United States government does not give land back to Indians anymore. They, there are monetary compensation, but as long as something's private property, it is not going back to the tribes in a land claims case. So Cornell is not in danger of losing its immense uh, realm to the, to the Indians. So I think it has to do with the politics, with the state politics. So we haven't been able to do that. We had a genetic diversity project here a couple of years ago, you may remember it, which is totally uh, opposed by Indian peoples because what it tends to do is homogenize, break down political and tribal boundaries and homogenize everybody in a genetic pool. But we were never consulted about that to begin with. We finally wrote a letter of protest about it. Um, and I have to say that the people that were running that project here were very generous and met with us and sort of admitted they were unconscious about the whole um, the whole native resistance to these um, uh, genetic projects. Were, did any of you guys participate in that? This is not a critique if you did. Uh, and all we, we suggested to our folks that they not participate in it, but I mean, if students wanted to do it, it was fine. You know, it takes your, they take a swab of your DNA and they prove to you that you're not who you think you are. That's essentially what they do. We all came from Africa and we're all mixed up with, you know, all of these genetic uh, resources that we have. But of course, that doesn't tell us who we are politically, right? It doesn't tell us what the black community is politically or the native community is politically. Indian tribes, by the way, by federal Indian law, Indians are recognized not racially in federal Indian law, but politically, okay? There have been cases specifically. So it's a political designation. It's racial only, right, if you're off reservation, you know, and then you come under civil rights laws. You know, if a restaurant doesn't want to serve you because you're an Indian or something or you're discriminated against in housing, you can then, uh, you know, go through the, the, the sort of civil rights laws that have been constructed. But on an Indian reservation, um, you're a political entity. You're not a racial um, entity. So that, I think, is sort of interesting as well. In any event, um, so doing Native studies is a lot more than doing Native studies. Let me end with that. No, it's really doing American studies or global studies. Um, and I think everybody should be doing these things, uh, should be conscious of what's going on in the world, uh, should be able to think uh, outside the particular place that um, we inhabit. Um, hence my argument for doing this. Um, what about the literature that you teach in? I teach no literature. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, how how recent is um, um, Indian writing? And, yeah. And literature? Very good question. Yeah. I, I, it's interesting. This is an English department, and I sort of always am talking like I'm either a legal person or a sociologist or a political science person. I do. Te I'm teaching a course right now. In first of all, Indian uh, cultures are begin as oral cultures. So writing um, is relatively recent. It really begins in force in the 19th century, and it comes out of a colonial situation when you're forced to then start learning another language. A lot of Indian languages are transliterated now, but most Indian writing is done in English. Uh, it's done in English uh, for a couple of reasons. It's done in English because um, English will get you a larger reading public clearly than any Indian language will get you. And also, increasingly, Indians uh, have lost touch with their own languages. Uh, and so they're raised in English uh, because it's obviously the, it's the, dominant, uh, the dominant language in all senses of the word. But Indian writing begins in force in the 19th century. I teach a lot of Indian um, uh, literature. And the Indian novel really begins in force, Indian fiction, we could say, in the 20th century. Um, and picks up steam uh, in the 1960s with what's called, in the jargon of, the, of literary history, the American Indian Renaissance, where you start to get a lot of Indian poets, fiction writers, uh, essay writers, um, and it's a very rich uh, body of literature. I always teach, when I teach uh, in the law school or in law schools, uh, I make 
all my, my folks who are studying federal Indian law read native literature because native literature, among other things, um, is a running commentary on colonialism in the United States and on federal Indian law. And typically when I teach native fiction, which I'm doing right now actually, I have a law and literature and contemporary Native American fiction class, um, I teach legal cases with, uh, with the novels we're reading to show the, the way they, um, the way they, they interact. I, look, I, I was going to read actually some texts, see how many of these texts, you know, I did this once with a graduate, with our graduate colloquium, I brought in a bunch of theoretical native uh, theory texts and, and asked people how many of these they knew. No one knew, knew uh, any of them. Uh, and that tells you something which um, I, I won't elaborate. I'm also reading graduate applications right now and the number of people that can do anything outside of Western theory is almost nil, which is too bad too. Um, I, I uh, cut my teeth on Western theory. Neil and I went to grad school together at Johns Hopkins, which is one of the, the hearts of uh, Western theory. So this is not a critique of Western theory, which is very valuable, obviously, but it's a, it is uh, also that without other, there are other kinds of theory that are extremely useful and also act as critiques of Western theory. So in any event, let me just read you from my thinking from a different place, the texts um, that I'm uh, that I'm teaching, and just see how many of them you know. Okay. I won't ask you to raise your hand, uh, but I am taking names. And... <laughs> there will there will be there will be some, there will be severe penalties. And, uh... So we started with David Harvey's A Brief History of Neoliberalism. So, okay, people, uh, who, people doing theory, particularly social political theory, know David Harvey. He's a really smart guy. Uh, then we read... Pardon? Yeah, also, yeah, he was there when we were there. Geographer, a political geographer. Um, so then Linda Tua Y. Smith, who is Maori from New Zealand, uh, Decolonizing Methodologies, we read her, which is a critique of Western theory in a colonial um, context, uh, but also a, a use of Western theory as well as indigenous theory. It's a good introduction to indigenous uh, theory. Uh, then uh, we read um, an, an article, well, we read the Zapatista's Sixth Declaration of the Selva Lacondana, which is um, their manif the Zapatista Manifesto, the last one they wrote, 2005 from Chiapas, which uh, is a, actually a great text to take a look at the way uh, socialist or Marxist theory and indigenous theory come uh, together. There's some really interesting interactions, um, interactions there. Um, then we read a pamphlet which is now quite popular amongst uh, folks doing indigenous studies called Buen Vivir, um, uh, which is a translation of the Quechua word sumac cause, which means the good life. And it's precisely the opposite of what we think of in the West as the good life. It's about balance. It's about conservation of resources. Um, and it's being used in Latin America quite a bit. It's written by, actually by a German uh, fellow. Um, uh, but it synthesizes in an extremely useful, useful way. Um, um, we're going to be reading it in the lore and the writing seminar um, uh, in a useful way, what indigenous thinking is at, at the moment. Um, then we read a, a great poem um, by Simon Ortiz, who's uh, from Acamo Pueblo, and this is a terrific poem called Fight Back, which is about native resistance from the Pueblo revolt of 1680 right up to the, the uh, resistance to um, exploit corporate exploitation of uh, mine workers in the Grants uranium belt in the 1960s, 70s. Um, then we read a wonderful book by Keith Vassa, who's an anthropologist who works with the Civic Apache. Uh, it's about the importance of storytelling because um, as Arnold Krupat, who's a wonderful scholar of Native American studies, has pointed out, Native philosophy is not transmitted analytically, it's transmitted through narrative. This is really, I mean, they give an importance to what we call literature that we don't give to literature anymore. And I think for literature students, this can be an eye-opener um, as well. So this is a book of these uh, stories and the, their, their social place in uh, Native communities called Wisdom Sits in Places. Um, so, um, then we read Gary Witherspoon's uh, book about Navajo kinship and marriage, which I was talking a little bit about the Navajo system f of kinship. And then we look at Navajo uh, creation stories, the DNA Bahani, uh, which focus on this issue of gender balance um, and in a much different way than we think about gender in the West. Uh, so it, it really is, um, uh, it precedes by hundreds of years Judith Butler's gender trouble. <laughs> Let me say that. Uh, 
So the, the key figure at Navajo, the key philosophical figure and, and uh, figure in their histories and stories, is a figure called Changing Woman. And in Navajo, that is Asan Nadlehe. And literally translated that, translated, that means without contradiction, it would be a contradiction in the West, woman of indeterminate gender. So think about that. You can't say that uncontradictorily or paradoxically. It's a paradox in the West. It's not a paradox at, um, at Navajo. Then we read Leslie Marmon Silko. Maybe she's the best known native writer today. Uh, we, it's an autobiographical piece called The Turquoise Ledge. I also uh, teach her great, massive apocalyptic novel, Almanac of the Dead, uh, which has some very interesting stuff where she, uh, uh, that combines Marx with uh, indigenous thinking. There's a character in the book, uh, Angelita La Escapia, who's the head of a resistance movement in Latin America, who does this whole discourse on what's, what, what about Marx is really useful and what goes against indigenous thinking. It's a, a, a very interesting. Then we read a book by Gregor Cajete, who's um, uh, a Pueblo person uh, who teaches at the University of New Mexico called Native Science. And we talk about um, that particular um, uh, conception of the universe and the way it differs from and could interact with Western science. And then we read something out of Australia by um, C.F. Black, Chris Black, who's a friend and an aboriginal lawyer uh, called The Land as a Source of the Law, which talks about indigenous legal principles, which are all grounded in kinship and land relationships, um, rather than sort of uh, coming from a rather a an abstract conception of, of the law. Um, and that's that class. Um, in the novel class, we, do, we read a lot. In the fiction class I'm teaching right now, we read just a range of, uh, of fictions from really terrific Native writers. Silko, Gerald Visner, I could, you know, make Diane Glancy, uh, what have you. So there's a rich Native literature, um, which I think uh, needs to be more incorporated into, quote, unquote, American um, and English literature. Um, so anyway, thanks for the question. Yeah, Andy. You commented on this um, before I came in, but I wondered what the American Indian program offered that's different from sort of what majors and other things around here can offer. I mean, what kinds of things happen as a result of that being uh, here? Well, I think, you know, what happens is, is it, it just, it, they offer these things from a native perspective. So you can take natural resource courses, but those natural resource courses will look at native ideas of conservation. Um, and balance. You can take anthropology courses. I know that uh, Paul Nadasti, who's my colleague in anthropology, teaches wisdom sits in places. A lot of us do. Um, or he'll look at, he works up in Canada. Uh, his courses will look at specific uh, um, cultural situations in Canada. He's very interested in the legal situation in Canada um, and also in some of the um, environmental issues I'm interested in, as, uh, interested in as well. So, I mean, wherever you go, art history, Jolene Rickard, who's now the head of the um, American Indian program, teaches, um, talks about native art, photography, sculpture, painting. Um, that's certainly going on. If you go to Santa Fe, New Mexico, the Museum um, of American Indian Art, of Contemporary American Indian Art, is a really a rich place to look at what's going on in native communities today, as well as the traditional art forms that are carried on. So, I mean, this is the, I think this is the point of native studies. It just gives you another, it gives you a, a place to think about who you are and where you are, um, and so it gives you that kind of opportunity from a from a different uh, from a different perspective. Is that? I guess I was just wondering how the program itself here kind of brought people together in some kind of different sort of critical mass. In you mean the American Indian program? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, we're still we're still trying to identify ourselves and what we do that's different, and and in fact. Uh, I had suggested, and I, it was taken up positively. I'm, I'm not sure what form it will take. That because around the country there, are, <coughs> excuse me, there are about a hundred American Indian programs in the United States, and they all have, have tried to take on a certain identity to say what they do that's different from what everybody else is doing. Um, so actually, the, the course I teach, thinking from a different place, the program like that as a sort of uh, mindset, and so it may come out as the as, as a sort of uh, on the, eventually, I'm not sure, um, but it was, it was a, people seem to take it up very positively as a way of identifying what we do, which is think, actually, I think, thinking from a different place. I think it's the one place you can go in Cornell that has a, a definite perspective on what the West is doing as well, from a Native perspective, as well as what Native 
peoples are doing um, uh, globally. We're also, we're going to change our name, I don't know when that's going to take place, to the American Indian and Indigenous Studies Program, because a lot of us now are working across the board in Australia and New Zealand and Latin America as, as well, although American Indians should um, take that, take that. And typically, unfortunately, the United States, of course, appropriated the term America to mean just the U.S., but I think that's breaking up now, too, and uh, so we can talk about the Americas. So that's, I think, what we do, what we do differently. Um, and those commonalities, that some of which I talked about, extend across the disciplines. Um, yeah. yeah, I know you were... I have a question over here. So, uh, Professor, you've been talking how um, integral it is to study this indigenous group that provide us with different perspective and uh, in more macro scheme of things, and how you question the very concept of indigenous when they were actually the dominant occupant of this very land, and um, I've gone to a few lectures by Professor um, Shelley Wong or Ella Diaz, who does Asian American or Latino Americans, and how um, arguably even some Latinos and Asians in Southern Texas or Southern California almost predates the um, immigrants from the West Europe. But, and of course there's this whole debate of what really constitutes this so-called Western civilization canon, but my problem, I guess, mm -hmm. is that um, personally, before I got into Western civilization, I sort of went back to East Asia, kind of exploring my own roots, and mm -hmm. I find it very valuable. Like you mentioned, Western civilization still has its own value. But when I look around my peers at this college, um, needless to mention the indigenous study, they don't even study Western civilization, where they come from. So I guess, <laughs> where is... <laughs> Right. I, yeah, go ahead. So, um, do you see any hope? <laughs> ah, the word hope. <laughs> Long question. <laughs> this generation's trajectory, because you, you mentioned about the whole political arena and system of this country and how you look at the political ads and this um, classical propaganda schemes and it works to the mass that if you put the celebrities and celebrities at advocates or candidates, it really works as stupid as it seems. So, um, I'm sorry, I just get really frustrated when I mm -hmm. talk about this. So sure, sure, sure. Well, you make bring up a good point. It would be nice if people knew about Western history before they uh, learned about indigenous history, or learned about, the, well, the two are Im imbricated. Look, I, I think. Um, I said at the beginning, I think there's a failure of critical thinking. I think what we're facing now, and there's going to be, I got invited on campus, the Sun puts on this dialogue series, and they're going to talk about the humanities. Um, the, 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 the statistics are not, are not good. Uh, Cornell is rapidly becoming a STEM-centered uh, universe. Uh, this tech campus down in New York is not helping things. Um, it's draining, I think, attention and a lot of funds, although the administration would say, no, it's just, it's, you know, it's its own sort of, uh, pot, I think it, it, it has that effect. Um, I believe I have these statistics from one of my colleagues. I think everybody in the English department saw them at one of our meetings that 80% um, now of applicants to Cornell express an interest in STEM fields. Uh, and I think we're graduating 45% now out of STEM uh, subjects. Uh, we are losing people in the humanities. And I think the humanities, not just English, but English importantly, um, uh, is a place where you do learn critical thinking. I think that's what the humanities really do in a way that n other disciplines can't do it. They have their specialized modes of critical thinking, but I think that the humanities tend to, to, to teach critical thinking in a way that, let me say, is useful for democratic, uh, democratic citizens. So the decline in the humanities, and this is nationwide, I mean, it's not just happening at Cornell, is uh, disturbing. Uh, to say the least. Um, I don't usually talk in terms of hope or not hope. I mean, I just do what I do. Uh, I'm not a cynic. Um, I'm not, you know, I don't think I'm pessimistic in the sense. I don't think those words are useful anymore. I mean, if we actually sort of confront the abyss right now, things are not good. Um, the climate business is terrible. Uh, you know, we're like lobsters in this slow boil. We're not feeling the heat, but we're going to get cooked. Um, if something isn't done, and nothing is, is really significantly is being done. I mean, you go to these international climate conferences and they just fight with each other. Um, you know, the emerging countries want to use the fuel to get, to, to get more productive, and the, uh, the large countries, this quote-unquote developed countries, whatever that means, 
um, the developed countries don't want to give it up. Um, jobs, you know, I, so et cetera, et cetera. So things don't 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 look good. Nevertheless, one comes out and talks about these things, and um, I suppose the very act of actually mounting a critique suggests that there's some kind of hope, uh, whatever that may mean. But I don't see the trends right now. Let me just be blunt, um, as positive. I see the trends as negative, um, and um, I don't think you know the. Other irony about this is, is if the the actual number of STEM jobs out there, right? There are more STEM people out there now than there are STEM jobs. Um, that's one statistic that might might be useful. But um, I think the decline in the humanities indicates what I would call decline in critical thinking uh, generally, and I don't see any pushback, really massive pushback. I see a lot of talk and that. Uh, we also have these massive online courses um, which are now intersecting with education. And of course, those are mostly STEM-centered courses. Um, they're homogenizing uh, a lot of knowledge, I think, in ways that are not uh, productive. Um, but that just is, that's just another example of a movement away from the humanities towards a kind of mass knowledge and towards a kind of production of, of knowledge, which is a very um, assembly line. Um, so. Yeah, no. So anyway, I don't know if that speaks to your um, speaks to your uh, question. But the only place you're going to learn these things, history, English. I mean, one of the things that English does that nobody else really does, which I think is the the root of critical thinking. Let me put in a plug here uh, for my discipline: is it teaches you to close read stuff. Um, and uh, the way I define critical thinking, actually, in the book I'm reading, is being able to pick out contradictions in discourses and then knowing what to do with those contradictions, what they mean when there's a contradiction in the discourse. And so without those skills, I think, um, and you can see this in, in students um, that you teach through certainly no fault of their own. They're not getting this in high school, and then you're trying to bring it to them. Um, you can see that the, the skill of close reading is not a skill that is being developed as a central skill uh, in, the, you know, in, edu in an educational trajectory. Uh, and we could talk about why not. I mean, I don't think the government wants an active citizenry. Well, certainly the corporations don't. The corporations don't want you to come on board at wherever and start asking questions about what you're producing. They just want you to produce. I think there's one more question here before we okay. close. Um, real fast, I was interested as to what you think of the word tribe mm -hmm. um, as opposed to like using sort of like can you be a tribe, like can you be a nation? Mm -hmm. um, you know, do you think tribe is sort of like a, a colonialistic term where it's mm -hmm. sort of seen as like uh, treating, you know, Native people as like a one-dimensional, um, you know, like group of people instead of having them like a three-dimensional kind of group? Yeah, well, tribe is a Western term. The, these were, this is not a native term. And it was used to homogenize uh, groups of people who were saying, you know, native societies traditionally before colonialism were decentralized, kinship-based societies. Clan is a much better word to describe the kinds of relationships. Um, they weren't calling themselves tribes. Nation comes out of federal Indian law and the fact that they had to adopt that term in order to deal with the federal government. Uh, if you read federal Indian law from the beginning, they are denominated nations so the treaties could be signed with them, forced on them, since land is not fungible in traditional native thinking. That's extremely important. Can you define fungible? I feel certain there must be someone in this world. In other words, land is not property in the way we understand it in the West. No one could buy or sell land. That wasn't even a concept. The land was the place you lived. It was part of the kinship system, um, and it sustained you and you sustained it. Okay, that's the traditional uh, relationship uh, with, with land. As soon as the West came in, land got converted into property. That's what the Poetics of Imperialism is about in my book. Uh, land got converted into uh, property, and, were, and the whole uh, apparatus of legal jargon was imposed on Indian communities. So they became nations, all right? Uh, they entered into treaties. Land became property. I mean, this whole system was imposed, and they were compelled to deal with it because of sheer, of sheer force. Tribe comes along with that. I, I think that's a word in part. And there's been a lot written about it. You know, it, it was used in Africa uh, to describe African formations when colonialism arrived in Africa, which are not the same as native formations here. I think there was more centralization, for example, in certain native, in certain African uh, tribal configurations. I'm not an expert on Africa, but that's my sense of it. 
Whereas in, in, this, in this country, except the Mayans, the Aztecs, and the Incas, who had a short shelf life, uh, native communities were decentralized, clan-based communities. The terms that were used were ter terms of uh, kinship. Um, so nation, tribe are actually alien words. Now, Indians, this is typically happens, you use a word long enough or are forced to use a word long enough and you start to adopt it in your own ways um, and try to positivize it. So the Navajos call themselves, the, the Hopis call themselves the tribe. They don't call themselves the Hopi nation, by the way. So some groups use tribe, some groups use nation. The Navajo nation really is a very, very late developing term. The Navajos didn't write a constitution um, something that the federal government was uh, compelling Indian tribes to do until 1969. Uh, in fact, they don't have even a constitution today, excuse me. They adopted the term nation in 1969, right? So before then, they weren't thinking of themselves in the, that term. So that's sort of the take on that. So you don't go wrong if you say tribe um, or nation, really. But I, knowing the history of those terms, I think, is, um, is useful. Thanks for coming, too. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.